eBay Motors is here for the ride. Elbow grease and a whole lot of love transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a drive entirely its own. LED headlights, spoilers, whatever you need. eBay Motors has it at affordable prices. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride every time. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. People are driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. With over 350 million global monthly visitors, Indeed's matching engine helps you find quality candidates fast. You get to ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. It's not just about hiring faster, though. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. Don't search. Match with Indeed. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash podcast. Just go to Indeed.com slash podcast right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash podcast. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Hello, this is international football commentator Derek Ray, and you're listening to the Ranks FC podcast. Hello Rank Squad and welcome to Rank CFC and welcome to another extract from our Monday Patreon post box in which we looked at all of the international action that took place over the course of this weekend. This extract though is about the USMNT a dos a cero against Mexico to win the CONCACAF Nations League. A three-peat for the US in this tournament and a big morale booster ahead of of hosting this summer's Copa America. We discussed all of it, what this USMNT team looks like, the differences between that performance and the one we saw against Jamaica last week, and just that step up in a big moment. We hope you enjoy. Firstly, a big congrats to all of our listeners across the pond who three-peat CONCACAF Nations League champions, the USMNT, one dos a cero, against Mexico, one of those results that just seems to keep coming up. Um, that's where we're going to start today uh, with the USMNT. And we'll start with this from D-Boy, who gave us a really good rundown. He said, game over, USA champions again. I didn't manage to watch the Jamaica game. And after your assessment, I was worried. Me too, D-Boy. Uh, I only tuned in from the Adams goal onwards, though. And it looked a relatively assured performance. A lot of good pressure on the Mexican goal. A couple of sketchy moments at the back. Didn't concede any glaring chances and a hugely important clean sheet win ahead of the Copper. Super proud of the team for coming back from where they were a couple of nights ago. I didn't want to talk about some of the Mexican fans chanting when I first heard it, but the more it went on, the more I dreaded the ball going out for a Turner goal kick, the more I felt I had to say something, even if it's already been said. Calling someone a slur under any circumstances is disgusting. Using it to intimidate an opposing team is just cowardly and a disgrace to the game that these fans claim to love. Imagine for a second... If the American fans shouted the English equivalent, I would find it hard to support my own team and the backlash would be immense. Whether these fans understand the gravity of what they're saying, and as a gay football fan myself, it's much more personal than just a slur, football authorities must focus on removing this sentiment from the game as much as any other bigotry. La Liga, I'm looking at you. It's just a shame that Spanish is such a beautiful language, but thanks to these chants, I'm far more familiar with the ugly side of it than I should be. To end on a positive note, I could only find coverage for this game with Spanish commentary, of which I understood probably about 3%. So here's a mini ranking of the three best things about that. Three, I'm a sucker for a Spanish goal call. So that's always fun. Two, they called Tim Weyer, Timmy Weyer, or even just Timmy, which left me a little bit bemused. And number one, hearing a flurry of Spanish and then sticking out in the middle of it in a perfect American accent, Tim Ream, and then more Spanish as if it was completely natural formation. <laughs> never. <laughs> I mean, yes, in terms of performance, the difference between this and the game against Jamaica was absolutely night and day. Now, it didn't mean that the US was suddenly an incredibly fluid, slick passing machine, 
But I think that we're going to see this team try and be more direct, more transitional, look for those opportunities. You know, Bahal has talked a lot about verticality and trying to get into those spaces. And it was something that Jesse Marsh talked about on the broadcast as well. I don't think this US side is going to be pretty to watch. And I also think that's probably okay for the most part. Now, when it's bad, it's going to be bad. And it was bad midweek against Jamaica because there was no sense of them being able to move them all into dangerous areas. But as a performance as a whole, this was incredibly different and much more composed, much more assured. And it didn't feel like everything was running into a brick wall at the halfway line. Now, part of that is probably Tyler Adams' influence in the first half. He only played 45 minutes, but what a way to crown it with that goal. Um, but I did think that generally it was it was it was a far improved performance. Um, and on the chanting, yeah, uh, this is it. Protocol obviously followed in that the game was paused by the referee and the offenders were supposed to be removed. But it got more and more frustrated and more and more kind of prevalent throughout the the second half of this one. I think. The problem here is, I mean, there's plenty of problems here. There's, there's, there's lots of things wrong with all of this. The issue I think I have is that it feels like it's being used by or weaponized, if you will, by a small section of supporters who are therefore trying to get at their own team, who are trying to use it to try and basically complain about performances. And look, Mexico weren't great, really weren't. But you kind of look at that and think, well, if that's the case, and it is... You know, if you're using that as a, oh, I'm frustrated, then you've got to understand, you know, the implications of what you're saying. And whilst the term in question being used is a complete Mexican slang for a male prostitute, it has hugely homophobic undertones. And therefore, to hear it again and again, and look, this is not the first time we're doing this again, we're talking about this same thing over and over again, it has to be addressed and we've seen the Mexican Federation, we've seen the players come out and speak out against it. And yet it continues to be a part of this conversation every time we have it. And at that point, I couldn't agree with D-Boy more. It's one of those it's it's cowardly to use it to try and intimidate people, especially in terms of I'm not sure how effective that is as a you know as a technique. It would not that it would be fine if it was. But it's sudden, it's not like, oh right, cool, this is this is working miracles anyway. It it just feels like as you know, as he says, the coward's way out. And it means that instead of talking, you know, about what was a very good game of football, not necessarily the highest quality, but in terms of competitiveness, I enjoyed myself. We're now talking about this again and fan behavior has to be improved because we're going around in circles over and over again here. Yeah, definitely. Um yeah, annoying to even have to talk about that. But like in terms of the performance, like I guess it's it's good news that they can lift their levels when they have to. Um, and maybe it's a mindset thing. And maybe they go into the match a few days ago and it feels like a game they should win. So they think it's a game they will win. And so you struggle to motivate yourself in the same way. And a game like this, there's no problem with motivation. And you can just elevate yourselves in a way similar to what Chelsea have had to do this season, I guess, like whenever they've been confronted with a situation where they know they have to turn up, they typically have turned up kind of what us have done here. And I think it will be symptomatic of what we always see with the U S um, in terms of playing direct football. When you win, it'll be fine when you don't win or it's really poor, it won't be fine. And it's going to be the same old, fingers pointed at the same old people so um yeah i mean it's it's a good night it's a good moment and it's encouraging but i still wouldn't say that this is convincing enough to prove that this is what to expect for the future i thought clint dempsey was interesting on on cbs the other night and he basically was just like i haven't really seen the usmnt play well since the last nations league before this one. And before that, he was like, the last time that the US played well was probably against England in the World Cup. Now, I think that would probably fit with what you're saying here about, you know, raising your level in, in certain games. I don't think that the US are, look, they've, they've won this three times in a row. They have asserted a, a fair amount of dominance over the CONCACAF region. But coming into this next period where we're going to see a Copa America and then we're going to see a World Cup, there there shouldn't be any reason to you know, with, with, with what's coming up on a home schedule, there should be no reason to be not motivated at any point. 
And the US aren't good enough in, the, in that kind of regard to be like, cool, we'll just coast through loads of games. And I think we saw that midweek. And maybe that's maybe that was the, you know, the kick that they needed to be like, wow, we played out that game, we're gonna get, you know, get our asses handed to us. But actually, when we're kind of looking at it as a, you know, a period of of, of discussion, you're like, you have to be coming up to a home World Cup with a home Copper America, you have to be motivated for every single game. You have to be you like, can't, no, you can't. This is the thing. You can't. Like, I, I can't. I bet you can't. Every time you go to a Fulham game, are you as up for watching Fulham play against Burnley as you are for Fulham against Chelsea? It's just not natural. And that's the problem you've got. It's 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 within you. It's not, oh, we'll win. Oh, we won't need to put in as much effort. It's, it's not like an actual thing. I don't think anyone ever turns up thinking that it is just a natural thing that happens. And I don't really know how you change that, to be honest. It's not just America that have this problem. England have this problem massively. No, no, no. Like, England really like struggle club, against smaller nations. At club nations. level, I could almost buy it. At club level, no, it happens at international all season. the time, mate. All the time we see this at international level. Right, mate, I don't turn up to any podcast not motivated. I give you that for free. And, uh, and that's, that's, I do. That's, that's the crux of it. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> um... No, I think it's. I honestly think this is a problem that runs way beyond the US, and I would, I would definitely say that England have this same, very similar issue. And I think that a large part of it is that you've now got a team there of individuals that, on a week by week basis, are involved in massive club matches and are around massive individuals in terms of the sport. And so, when you're suddenly faced with to be playing a team. You will look, you'll know that you're a better player than them. It's hard to elevate yourself naturally, and you've got to find you've got to find that. And I, and I, I think that that is going to be an ongoing problem for the US. Yes, it will help having home tournaments for sure because there's that that need to do well. And again, I say about England, England. When do we do well? When we're in home tournaments, like that's when we tend to motivate ourselves. So yeah, it's it's, a, it's an internal problem that I don't think will just grow away. eBay Motors is here for the ride. Elbow grease and a whole lot of love transformed 100,000 miles in a body full of rust into a drive entirely its own. LED headlights, spoilers, whatever you need. eBay Motors has it at affordable prices. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride every time. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. People are driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. With over 350 million global monthly visitors, Indeed's matching engine helps you find quality candidates fast. You get to ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. It's not just about hiring faster, though. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. Don't search. Match with Indeed. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash podcast. Just go to Indeed.com slash podcast right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash podcast. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. All right, let's take a couple more takes. Sam says, Tyler Adams is the man. Charlie Bartomay says, I know it's late, but if you haven't seen it already, go and watch the Tyler Adams goal. Do you have any idea why Gio Reyna is playing in such a deep role? I've seen Greg do some weird things, but Gio dropping into the back line seems more harmful than helpful. Um, Ethan says, what a goal, Tyler Adams. It seems to be the overlooked club players are the ones who continue to carry the USMNT to victory. Do we have a chance this summer at Copper America to make a deep run? What about the Olympics? Also, what does the midfield look like for the Copper? Will Gio continue to come on from the bench or could he get a chance to be a role player this summer? Well, I think that you're, you're looking at different things, right? And, and, and that's, that's fine. The, the Gio Reyna playing deep thing was weird. Jesse Marsh was talking about it at halftime. He was like, I'm not quite sure what Bahalta's trying to do here. He was like, I'm not sure why he's putting him into a role that other people could fulfill the moments that make Gio Reyna special or when he's able to influence the game in the final third. And there isn't that many of those kind of players. But I do think that what we're looking at here, and, and actually I thought the Tyler Adams 45, Johnny Cardoso 45, is a, nice, is a really good place for the US to be. Because suddenly there was a player there playing at a very high level, week in, week out, in Johnny Cardoso now, 
who is able to step in for someone as influential as Tyler Adams. And that makes a difference, right? Because we've seen that when there is certain very key players who are, are missing from the spine, things can fall apart. They can fall apart for anyone. We'll talk about England in a bit, but very similar vibes. I think that when you have a player like Johnny and of Johnny's calibre, who's able to step in there and be like, cool, if something goes wrong with Tyler, we have cover, we have space. I'm now intrigued by what the makeup of that situation looks like. But I think the depth that the US now have in this midfield area is a very, very promising sign ahead of the copper. Yeah. Um, in terms of the goal, I think, oh, no, obviously it's an absolute belter. Um and I've watched it umpteen times already. Yeah. And you don't it's get an unstoppable week. It's an unstoppable strike. But if you look at the manner of the two goals, look, I'm not saying US didn't deserve to win this game. They did. But, you know, they're not carved out opportunities. They're not like, um, it's not come from a style of play necessarily that they've actually won this game in terms of the goals that they've scored. So that can be a little hard to judge. But, um, Ultimately, it doesn't matter here. You know, you had a game, you had to go and win. And and the US, you know, wanted to continue to hold that dominance over Mexico. And they've got it. Um, but yeah, I'm always, when, when you get games like this and you get a, just a, a shot out of nowhere, you know, 40 yards or whatever it is from him, I don't know exactly, but it's incredible strike. But it's not normal, you know, that ain't going to happen again. So there is then, if you were to think deeper about it, you'd be like, okay, but what if that moment hadn't cropped up? I know it's, it sounds silly and it's all hypothetical, but in terms of game analysis, that's what the US will be doing. They'll be like, okay, well, what actual, how high were our goal scoring opportunities in this game? What actually is our best form of attack? Like where are we getting the most joy out of this team? And are we fully getting the best out of a crop of players, which are, extremely good and extremely talented and I guess that's where the conversation comes in around Gio Reyna and other players that um, have the ability to to change games yeah definitely yeah I, I think this is it and how it's going to look in the summer I mean Bahalta has to be practical right he, he has to be a bit more pragmatic and, and I think that that's what the US are trying to build towards because it's one thing being like, okay, cool. We can win the nation's league. And look, this is a decent Mexico side, although they're a while away from where, where they were, I think. And, and in terms of the quality around them in these kind of competitions, it's not there in the same way that it will be in the copper. Right. So do you play against Argentina, for example, in the same way that you would play against Trinidad and Tobago or Jamaica? And that's no disrespect. You obviously have to adapt your situation as a sort of mid, you know, you'd put the US in that kind of mid range, right? The upper end mm. of it, absolutely. But at the copper, are they favourites? No, are they in the top three, probably not for me. Probably not. So you're now looking at it and thinking, well, how do you adapt that? How do you punch upwards rather than? And and that isn't necessarily being like, cool, we'll play really openly and take the game to Argentina and Brazil, because you'll get beaten by better players. So there has to be a level of pragmatism that I think makes it difficult. So the midfield might not have a number 10 in it when it comes to the US playing Argentina. You're playing the world champions, right? They might have to go with something a little bit more pragmatic in there. And that might be Weston McKenney, Tyler Adams, and Johnny Cardoso. It might be Eunice Moose there instead in the MMA, instead of playing Gio Reyna as a 10. But in games where the US will feel that they are favourites and able to, to dominate, get a foot on the ball, and, and maybe actually try to carve more out themselves then yes, I think you can soften that midfield and, and play a number 10 in there. And I think it's going to be interesting to watch how the US switch between different systems in order to try and get the best out of individual games. And that, I think, is where this question mark will be over Greg Bahalta. Look, on Thursday night, all of the comments, all of the takes were, he's got to go. Performances like this are unacceptable. Now he's won the tournament. His players continue to back him. Is there any chance in the world that Bahalter is not in charge of the copper? No, of course there isn't. Like, so yeah. we're, we're now at a point where you're like, I think we have to judge on what that looks like and what that versatility and pragmatism looks like when the US do turn up to the copper. But have they got a puncher's chance? Absolutely. With this amount of talent? Absolutely. 
Yeah, it's going to be about game management ultimately. And that's, um, you know, for Bearhalter, there's still a lack of trust there. And, you know, it's up to him to to prove people wrong. There, You know, Gareth Southgate has the same thing um, from my perspective. And you think he's always had that from the moment he went into that England job. And then suddenly he, those first couple of tournaments and he's getting, you know, Southgate, you're the one chanted at him and everyone in the nation loved him. And then now that's turned back the other way because now he's considered to be too negative again. And that's, this is the life of an international manager because you're being judged not by thousands of people as you are as a club manager typically, but by millions and of people. And that's different. It's very different and you're never going to please everybody. So it's, it's the results business because of that. Yeah, definitely. 100%. Uh, a couple more questions on this before we move on uh, to Europe. And this is from Carl Morgan. He says, let's talk Anthony Robinson. Dean, I know you've been, you've said you've been more than impressed with him this season. I'm seeing rumours of potentially leaving this offseason in a big money move away from Fulham. What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I think there's a chance he goes. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the uplift in Anthony Robinson has been massive. You know that I haven't loved him because I find him too inconsistent within the game, like not game to game, within a game. Like one minute, I'll think he's brilliant. The next minute, he, he'll get caught in possession. There's a gaping hole behind him and it gets exploited. But that's kind of gone. That You know, he's, he's, his defending is much improved and that's actually the side of his game that really fills me with confidence now in Fulham play. Like he's going forward, he's great. Um, and, you know, I, I you know... We watch his, his, him every week and you know his movements, you know where he's going to look to attack from, you know how fast he is and that he's pretty good. anticipation is extreme. Like it is yeah. so, so impressive. The way that he's on the move and, and, and reading interceptions before the ball's even been played. His game intelligence is, is absolutely right up there. And I think he's moved that now to going backwards as well. So it was always forwards and I think backwards that he's, he's now got that too. So look, I, I would be amazed if, it, if an offer didn't land for Anthony Robinson this summer, I'll be honest, I I think he's probably more likely to leave than Palinia, to be honest, because I think there are more Agreed. teams, there are more teams that would benefit and need an Anthony Robinson and could afford him than, look, benefit and need Palinia, yes, afford him is different. He's twi- probably, you know, 60 million pound player, whereas Robinson might be a 30, 35 million pound player. Um, and a year ago, I'd have probably bitten your hand off for £35 million for Anthony Robinson. And now I'll be pretty gutted about it, to be honest. But if I was recruiting at Liverpool, if I was recruiting at Bayern Munich, you know, any of these sorts of teams, I'd be thinking, right, well, we need to have a serious think about it as well. Yeah, especially if Fonzie Davis leaves. Yeah. I wonder, you know, if that's a, a space that Bayern I think it's might a, look to I, come I into. think that Robinson's genuinely a really good fit for Bayern Munich. Um, I, I think that that, actually makes a lot of sense. I don't want to wish it into happening, but if that deal happens uh, for him to leave Bayern Munich, it won't surprise me at all to hear Robinson mentioned. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, right, one from Samuel Veloth, who says, the difference in the number of players that the US have in European clubs, the day-to-day is distinct, the competition is distinct, said Mexico manager Jaime Lozano in the post-match. Having played Santi Jimenez for a whopping 25 minutes in total in this international break, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole around our shambles of an FA this time, so I'll instead ask what you think of the rumours linking Santi to Napoli as a front runner to replace Osimen. Though they're very different striker profiles, I think Santi could definitely do some damage in Serie A. What worries me most is his development potentially being hampered by De Laurentiis' determination to ruin anything good around that football club. Where else do you think Jimenez could take the next step in his career and thrive? Yeah, I, I thought this comment was weird considering he left out a lot of his Europa-based players in, yeah. in, in this break. And to then come out and be like, yeah, that's why they're better than us. I was like, mm, not, sure, not sure this is the, uh, the flex you think it is, my man. Yeah, um, that but, was your squad selection. I mean, to be fair, Santi didn't have a great day. Thought he'd won a penalty. Didn't win a penalty. Was a dive. Um, but equally, mm. trying to impact a game at that exact point with with it where it was didn't feel like a, a a bit natural fit for him either. So a strange little break for him. But I do quite like this Napoli move, and I think that whilst whilst Samuel's point here about 
um, about De Laurentiis is, is absolutely fair enough. I don't think that would necessarily be a massive problem if they were to bring Jimenez in here because I think he has the capacity to lead a Napoli side even if they are a little bit in the doldrums and maybe be able to be like, cool, I'm going to go put this on the table, perform for a couple of years and then make another step. It feels like a good step move to go yeah, from the Eredivisie yeah. to Napoli at this point. I, I, I like that as a fit. Yeah, I don't know enough about the actual transfer and the likelihood of it, but I do think that's a good step for him. And if you're moving on from Ossiman, then you've got to be careful how you replace him. And I think this is the kind of level of player that you're looking at in terms of, okay, what's he shown so far? But what's his potential going forward to? And what's his hunger to even push on? To be honest, if you if you are Napoli and you're looking for an Ossiman replacement, I, I wouldn't be looking for someone that's comfortable to just stay at Napoli. I'd be looking for someone who wants in two or three years to be pushing to go somewhere else because I think that's how you get the best out of players, especially at this this stage and age of their career. Yeah, yeah. I, I like it. I would like to see more of it. And, you know, there are certain places. I, I wonder if there is a space for him somewhere like a Roma, if they were to move on from Tammy. Obviously, he's had the entire season out with, with an ACL. What that looks like, going for, I, I like that as a fit too. But I think Serie A feels like a really nice place for Menes to... To turn up here, so I'm I'm going to be keeping an eye on that one. I think a Premier League move would work for him, but I'm wary of the pressure that comes with that. And I actually think that whilst obviously there's a different type of pressure at Napoli and the fan base, if you go in there and you know and you you hit the ground running, you'll be adored even if things aren't going well elsewhere. And I think that's pretty important in a in a way that maybe it wouldn't be in the other clubs he was is linked to. I saw you know West Ham links. I struggle with that, no, not knowing kind of where they're going to be at the start of next year and, and what that looks like. And if Moyes is going to still be there, all of these things still I have question marks over. So I do like a Serie A move. That's that, the that's one that I very much enjoy. Well, thank you very much for listening to that extract. We hope that you very much enjoyed it. And that little look at what the future holds for the USMNT, for Santi Jimenez, and for lots of different elements of these two teams going forward into a big summer of competition. On the rest of this post box, we looked at the England loss to Brazil, Endrick killing England's vibe and keeping them humble. And whether that means something has to change ahead of the Euros for Gareth Southgate's side. We also discussed Germany being France and suddenly looking like a team again, the Nagels Mannschaft, if you will. Havertz, Wurz and Musiala looking like a very vibey front three. We talked about Ireland playing against Belgium and taking a good performance out of that one first time John O'Shea has been in charge of the Ireland national team. We talked about the Netherlands beating Scotland 4-0. I didn't think I'd ever be talking about an unconvincing 4-0 win, but here we are. And Colombia, who are on a 20-game unbeaten streak that people might not be paying attention to. We also talked a little bit about MLS, about some transfer rumours. We talked about the Legends game that took place at Anfield and what that meant for Sven Goran Eriksson. And Germany leaving Adidas for Nike truly is one of those ones that makes you think that the game is gone and some other bits and bobs as well as ever the link to that full podcast is in the description we'd love to have you over on the Patreon if you want to hear more from us and there are free trials available to get stuck into that right now as well thank you so much for listening we will be back on Wednesday with the main episode as ever and we'll see you very shortly Rank Squad take it easy peace Final seconds of the game, a chance to score and the chance has gone begging. If your business's commerce platform keeps missing the target on golden opportunities, get the MVP you deserve. Get Shopify. (coughs) Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're a garage entrepreneur or IPO ready, Shopify is the only tool that you need to start, run and grow your business without the struggle. Shopify puts you in control of every sales channel. So whether you're selling signed football boots from Shopify's in-person POS system or you're vending vintage shirts on Shopify's all-in-one e-commerce platform, you are covered. And once you've reached your audience, Shopify has the internet's best converting checkout to help you turn them from browsers to buyers. What I love about Shopify is how, no matter how big you want to grow, Shopify gives you everything you need to take control and take your business to the next level. 
Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. And Shopify is truly a global force, powering Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across over 170 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash ranks, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com forward slash ranks to take your business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash ranks.